I seem to have picked up a little bit of a hoarse throat while overseas, so bear with me tonight. I'll try to speak slowly and distinctly so that I hope you'll be able to hear. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 16. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 23. The message is entitled, Witnessing in Court. Witnessing in Court, Acts 16, verses 1 through 23. Now, the last two times that we were in Acts was May 8 and May 15th. Hard cases make bad law and politics and problems. Uh, we are dealing with a number of issues in this series of what to do in relation to government. How should a Christian act as he relates to and interacts with government, especially in the case of legal issues that may arise? And as you know, we are in a country right now where there are a number of legal issues which are going to affect Christians and Christian businesses and the body of Christ in general in very negative ways. We see these with the most recent crazy laws about transgendered persons' rights and the transgendered bathrooms and other forms of insanity which are now being promoted by our government and which will put some great pressure on Christian businesses and on nonprofit organizations seeking to actually minister to others in the name of Christ and yet being forced into very stringent, narrow straitjackets of immorality. So it's a, an important series. Tonight we're going to be looking at Witnessing in Court Part 1, next week Part 2. But hard cases make bad law, politics and problems. And now what do you do when you finally get dragged into court and have to make an appearance before a judge? Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of knowing your word and of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate judge to whom all of us must give an account someday. There are those, in fact, the majority of the world don't believe it will happen. But your word has always proven to be true. Every prophetic statement of the past has come true literally, accurately, precisely, and exactly as you recorded it. We see the world around us today developing exactly like the Word of God said it would develop. And so we anticipate that all of the future promises which are yet to come will also come true exactly, literally, precisely, and just as you said. And so, Father, we pray that tonight you might help us to understand the application of the Word of God so that we might know what the Apostle Paul is doing in this particular passage where he stands before a judge, how to respond appropriately to questions asked, and what we must always do, always do, regardless of the situation in which we find ourselves. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. We pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, over the last five weeks, I've been gone. I've been in China. and. Um, really learning a lot. Uh, we think that we have it difficult here and it will get more difficult here, but we can see other places in the world where the difficulties have already arisen to a point where Christians are suffering in ways that we have not yet imagined here in the United States. But the time is coming, scripture prophesies it, when there will be a pressure put on Christians that will separate those who are true Christians from those who are only pretending to be Christians, those who go to church for social reasons, those who go to church for uh, perhaps business reasons, they uh, appear in church and therefore they are known in the community as upstanding community leaders, and therefore they do well for their own businesses while perhaps practicing undercover some rather crooked means of earning their money. But the time is going to come when those who are true believers are separated out from those who are only pretending, those who are fakes. Now, May 22nd, Dr. Waite presented The Greatest Possession from John 3.16. The 29th was this Sunday special DVD, Here I Stand, which was the history of American fundamentalism uh, by Dave DeCanio. And then June 5th was Reverend Keith Coleman on missions. June 12th was Reverend Daniel Waite, Shining Lights from Philippians 2, 12 through 18. And then on Father's Day, we had a DVD special, Final Exit. And all of us are going to make a final exit someday. And either you will end in heaven 
or you will end in hell. I hope you will end in heaven. We talked somewhat this morning about those who claim to be Christians and yet never have any indication in their lives that their lives have been transformed. They never have any pruning. They never have any chastening. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear in the book of Hebrews that if you don't get chastened, it means you just do not belong to God as one of his children. All of us do things that are sinful, and so God straightens us out. If you've never been straightened out, it's maybe because you don't have a right relationship or any relationship with the loving Heavenly Father. Now, I'm going to start tonight, although we're in chapter 26, I'm going to start tonight back in chapter 25, verse 13, because we need to do some a running start and a review of a few of the principles, and I'll make them very brief, but a few of the principles that relate to what's going to happen tonight. In Acts chapter 25, beginning in verse 13, through Acts chapter 26, verse 23. So it's an extended portion. I'll, I'll break it up in a couple of places uh, to make comment, but uh, we'll begin in verse 13 of chapter 25. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the, elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die, before he is accused, have his accusers face to face, and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved under the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Now what we noticed as we looked at this passage and what the Romans clearly understood and what the Jews clearly understood was the central issue at trial was the resurrection back there in verse 19. They had certain questions against him of their own superstitions and of one Jesus which was dead whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And that is indeed the central issue of all of history. If Christ is not risen from the dead, Christianity is a hoax. If Christ is not risen from the dead, if that's only mythology, like the Greek mythology, then we have no hope. Paul makes that very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, we are no better than the animals. We are merely a higher form of animal. But the scripture teaches that we're made in the image of God, and it proves that by the resurrection. The resurrection is the guarantee, it is the seal, that man has an eternal future and not merely a temporal hope. We have the guarantee because Christ rose from the dead. That's always the matter with the humanistic rationalist. He does not believe it because if he believed it, his house of cards would collapse. That is the nut that pagan evolutionists cannot swallow. It's the roadblock that the materialists cannot get around. It looms like an impending avalanche that will engulf the unbelieving climber on the mountainside, the resurrection of Christ. Never forget that. We need to remember that that is one of the things that Satan desperately wants us not to believe. He's placed blinders on unbelievers on that critical issue because that is the heart of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's the heart of the gospel. Paul says this is the gospel. 
verses 1 through 4 of Romans chapter 1 tell us that this is the gospel. It's exactly the same as you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The resurrection is central to the gospel. That is the great resurrection passage in the doctrinal epistles, and it begins with a statement that the resurrection is part of the gospel. Men and women cannot be saved unless they believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can't merely believe that Jesus is a good man. You can't merely believe that Jesus was a wonderful teacher. You can't merely believe that Jesus was a human being who died, because that's not enough. Without the resurrection, you do not have the gospel. I get very weary, and you've heard me say this before, of tracts that only speak of the death of Christ for our sins, but do not mention the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the death of Christ is meaningless. Listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you've also received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, in other words, if this doesn't make any sense, if it's not real, it's an empty, it's a vain hope. Now here's the gospel, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection has to be in harmony with the scriptures. It cannot be like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Millennial Donists who say that he did not rise from the dead, that his body evaporated into gases. The resurrection of Christ is central to the gospel. Those who deny the resurrection of Christ are not saved. Now, as we pointed out, even the most hard-hearted, unbelieving, God-hating pagans will not resist when you tell him that Christ died. All the unbelievers believe that. All the unbelievers will say, sure, of course we know Jesus died. They'll gladly accept it because death is the fate of all men. They've seen it. They've experienced it. They know that people don't generally come back from the dead. When you say that Christ died for our sins, he'll quibble with you because he doesn't believe that sin actually exists. And he certainly doesn't believe that he's a sinner. But when you tell him that Christ rose from the dead as the proof that he died for our sins and that his sacrifice was accepted by God the Father as the basis for our salvation, the pagan God-hater will turn red in the face, he will jump up and down, he'll scream blasphemies at you, and he will reject you. The resurrection of Christ is something that the natural man will not and cannot accept because it destroys every foundation of his miserable, lying life. That's why you must always emphasize the resurrection of Christ when you're presenting the gospel. Only the Christ of Scripture, only the risen Christ, can save a man from his sins. A dead Christ cannot save anybody. There are some places in the world where the churches are allowed to preach about the death of Christ, but they are absolutely forbidden to preach about the resurrection. That's very important. Why? Because the resurrection not only gives life, but it gives hope for the future. I just came back from a country where they are not allowed to preach the resurrection of Christ. They're allowed to preach his death, but they're not allowed to preach the resurrection. In the official churches that are open for public display to the world, they cannot preach the resurrection of Christ. They can preach that he died because, of course, even the most hard-hearted atheists will believe that he died. But they cannot preach the resurrection. The power of God unto salvation that Jesus rose from the dead. Because, you see, that gives hope for the future. And those who are in control of this type of country do not want people to have hope. They want, to believe, want them to believe that the only hope they have is in the government itself. It's a very serious issue. You see, there's some practical implications. If people have hope for the future, they are less likely to be docile. They're less likely to be easily controlled by the authorities. You know, a lot of Christians even have given up hope in light of the current political choices that seem to be available in this upcoming election here in the United States. But we must never give up hope because we serve a risen Christ, one who is coming again. And that's the second doctrine that countries like the one I have just visited will not allow the churches to preach. 
Because if you believe that hope is on the way, you can keep hanging on. If you believe that any moment the army might arrive around the corner to save you, you know, those who are in authority tremble at that doctrine. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming soon. And the scripture prophesies it. And we see it around the corner as we look at world events shaping up precisely and exactly like the Bible said that they would do. Just a couple of weeks. In fact, next week, isn't it? Fourth of July. There was hope in the colonies for freedom. Freedom from the oppression of Great Britain based on political realities. In the New Testament, as we've been looking here at these passages where they are putting Paul on trial for believing in the resurrection, for preaching the resurrection, that's why he's on trial. And he's going to witness about it in just a second as we get into our text tonight. But that is the key issue before us and why Paul says what he does in our text for this evening. The Jewish leaders rightly perceived that the doctrine of the resurrection was causing them to lose their grip of control over the Jewish people. They knew that as soon as he died on the cross. It wasn't just after Paul got up there and started rattling around and you know telling people about the resurrection. They said, oh man, we should have suppressed that earlier. They had tried to suppress it the day that Jesus died. The chief priests came and Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. They believed it more than the apostles believed it. They had heard him. It was clear. They understood it. Sometimes the disciples acted like their heads were out in the lake somewhere because they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about when he talked about his death and resurrection. But the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees understood it. And that's why they came to Pilate right after Jesus died and said, look, he was teaching he'd rise after three days. They even got the three days part. So we want you to set a watch, put a guard up, seal the stone, make it impossible for anybody to break in. There was no back door to the tomb. It was carved out of living rock. It had a gigantic stone weighing several tons rolled in front of the door. And they wanted to make it more secure than that. They wanted to be sure that Jesus did not come out of the tomb. Because they knew what that would do. If that managed to happen, what would they be able to say to the crowds that they controlled? You see, the resurrection was central to the truth of salvation. And they didn't want the Jewish people to have that hope. And there are many in the world today that want, don't want the people under their control to have that hope. That's the guaranteed hope. We asked the question, you remember, how much money would you take to deny the resurrection? As I think over all the people in the church, I tremble to think that there might be one or maybe more than one that has such a love for money that they would be willing to say on well, one occasion, if, if you will just once deny and we'll record you denying. You know that's how, how they do with political prisoners. We've seen that with prisoners of war taken by communist countries, for example. Some of you remember Vietnam. Some of you remember the American servicemen that were captured. Some of you remember World War II and the Japanese and American servicemen who were captured. Some of you remember the Korean War and American soldiers who were captured and then put on political display after being tortured, after being deprived, after being starved. They would say all kinds of things admitting to so-called war crimes because they'd been promised relief from their suffering. How much would it take to get you to just once, here you are being filmed, you only have to do it once, to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're in some stinking, filthy hole that has no sewer. You're in a tiger cage like they had in Vietnam, where you're all cramped over, you can't lie down, you can't stand up, you can only sit in crouched positions, 
day after day, day after day, week after week, month after month, sitting in your own filth, being fed just beer, mere scraps of food, leftovers that no one else would eat. And you're promised it'll all be over. And we'll give you a million dollars. We'll give you $10 million. We'll give you $100 million. And you can go back to the United States and live in luxury. All you have to say is, at one time I was a Christian, but I have finally come to the conclusion that communism is right. There is no resurrection. This is the only life that matters. And you'd only have to say that once. Would you do it? I think most of us here have never been in that kind of uncomfortable situation. Most of us don't know what we do. While I was in China, I read a very interesting biography in the evenings when nothing else was happening. It belonged to the friend who had invited me over there. It was the story of Louis Zamperini, written by a woman who has written many bestsellers on the New York bestseller list. Fascinating book. He was a world-class Olympic athlete. He was an unsaved pagan. And he went through the concentration camps of Japan. Later got married when he got out of the concentration camps. It's amazing that he lived through them when you read the story. But you begin to realize what men can do to men. He got married. His wife went to a Billy Graham rally. She got saved. She tried to get him to go. He didn't want to go. He loved to carouse. He loved to party. He loved to drink. He didn't want to have anything to do with God. But finally he went. And the night he went, God broke him. And he trusted Christ. When I read what he went through, I thought, how could a man stand that? pain. His aircraft went down. He floated on a raft for weeks in the middle of the ocean with sharks on every side. Starving, dying of thirst, finally picked up by the Japanese and sent to the concentration camps. People, I hope you get out of your box. I hope you begin to read some things. I hope you begin to consider some of the serious issues of life. Because without the resurrection, you will break. You will have no hope. And that's why pagan authorities do not want you to believe or to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. Because in a country where people are going through that kind of suffering, the resurrection gives hope. It gives the only hope there is because it gives hope beyond this life. I can't say enough about that. And that, of course, is tied very closely to the literal bodily return of Jesus at the rapture. That's why the rapture is called the blessed hope in the New Testament. Hope makes people unafraid to share the gospel because they know that this life is not all there is. If this life is all there is, you do everything you can to be self-preserving. But if you have hope for the future, you don't have to worry at all about what will happen. The second thing that we noticed was that pagan leaders here in this passage are trying to solve a spiritual problem. Of course, that's impossible. Pagans can never solve spiritual problems. They start with the wrong premise, therefore they will always come to the wrong conclusion. Text before us, Felix has already admitted that he had no way to solve the problem because he had nothing to write to Caesar that would stick as a crime. You know, the world will always try to find something wrong and if they can't find something wrong, they will make up something wrong. They will falsely accuse you. 
the things that stood out in our text, trying to deal with, with spiritual matters. These pagans are trying to deal with spiritual matters. They're trying to handle a case that rests on the resurrection of Christ, but they're not going to actually try the issue and the evidence for the issue. They're going to find some way to get around it. If they looked at the evidence, they would have to come to the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead because the evidence is strong. Many books have been written on that subject. Evidence that demands a verdict, for example, by Josh McDowell. Lee Strobel wrote a very excellent series of books dealing with the resurrection of Christ. Various lawyers have written related to legal process what would happen if you actually put this evidence on trial and come to the conclusion the resurrection is, unprovable, is provable legal fact. Those who deny it are denying what would pass in a court of law. The second thing that stood out became more evident as we moved further into the text that Agrippa was an expert in Jewish law and customs and evidence. Festus himself might have been new to the job, but with Agrippa, there was every reason to think that he understood the far-reaching implications of what Paul was teaching and preaching, because he was, in fact, married to a Jewess. Do you remember we talked about her? We talked about Bernice, his wife, a very beautiful, very wicked woman who had many adulterous affairs and married various relatives while the others were still alive and so on. Uh, wasn't satisfied with her incestuous relationship with her brother. She after became the mistress of Vespasian. When that was not enough, she became the mistress of his son Titus, a humongously evil woman. But she heard Paul preach. And there was no indication that she ever came to Christ, although she knew the truth. And we talked about how she died in the eruption of Vesuvius with her son. And it's recorded in secular history. So the lessons that we learned were, number one, unsafe pagans will never be able to reach the theological truth by legal means, just like Jewish law can't save you, neither can secular law. Number two, unsafe pagans who hear the truth clearly articulated are accountable, even if they do not believe, like Bernice. Number three, those who hear and reject are subject to the most severe judgments. And I think that that eruption of Vesuvius was a, a very good object lesson for all of us. Number four, even pagans understand that it's unreasonable to make Christian theology the basis for capital punishment. But that understanding doesn't stop them from trying to do it anyway. All over the world, it is a capital crime to believe and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. You can believe anything else you want, but Satan hates the truth. And so he motivates his people to kill those who preach the truth because it gives hope to others. And very soon, the devil's people lose their control when there is hope. Number five, even the best unsaved experts can only pass the buck and not come to a fair conclusion concerning faith in Christ because it takes faith in Christ to understand. And without that, they will never understand. And that brings us to our text for tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Now listen to this next verse. Agrippa is certainly going to be held accountable, has been held accountable, he's dead, for what he heard that day because he was not an ignoramus. He was not somebody who couldn't read and write. He was not somebody who had no concept of what the Jewish law promised and what the prophets had foretold. He was no ignoramus when it come to the promises of the Messiah. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. What was one of the biggest questions among the Jews? When will we receive our Messiah from God? Do you realize that at the time of the Apostle Paul, that there had been multiple different Jewish rebellions and revolts, starting in 168 BC with the Maccabean Revolt, trying to raise up a nation to be ruled by the Messiah? There were many who claimed to be the Messiah. Greeks had put some of them down, Romans had put some of them down. 
But there was an expectation that the Messiah would come and deliver Israel because it was promised in the Old Testament. Agrippa was not ignorant of that. Agrippa knew that that was a pressing question of the day. Agrippa understood the political implications. If Jesus rose from the dead, that would prove that Jesus is the Messiah. We talked about it this morning. Psalm 16, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's a great messianic prophecy concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We find the great promises in Isaiah 7:14 about the virgin-born Messiah, chapter 9, verse 6, about who he is in his person. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Agrippa knew the Holy Scriptures. Agrippa knew the Messianic expectations. Agrippa knew the promises of God. And Paul is now declaring to him, a man expert in the customs, all the customs, all the traditions of the Jews, all of the political context of going on in that time. He was an astute politician. He knew what it would mean if Jesus really rose from the dead. He knows what Paul is like because Paul tells him and he knows what the Pharisees believe. Listen to what he says. Paul is speaking. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first from mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. I don't have to go through this, but says the Apostle Paul, I have enough proof to show that I am not a half-breed. I have enough proof to show that I'm 100% Jewish. I have enough proof to show that I have been trained in all the customs of the Jews. So you and I, Agrippa, are on the same level when it comes to knowing what the Jews believe which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify. Isn't it interesting? No one came to testify at this trial other than the accusers. They would not testify to say the Apostle Paul, yes, he had this training. Yes, he knows the scriptures. Yes, he was the very best student of Gamaliel. He was the top student of Gamaliel, one of the top seven rambans of all of Jewish history. The top student. And he knows his stuff. None of them testified. Paul says, if they would testify, they'll tell you this. This was the great promise that we had. He says, after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, immediately, that would ring bells in Agrippa's head. He knew all the different parties. He knew the Zealots. He knew the Herodians. He knew the Pharisees. He knew the Sadducees. And he knew that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. He knew that the Zealots were a wild Jewish party of radicals. He knew that the Herodians were interested in only temporal things, in appeasing Rome. But the Pharisees, what was their key issue? The resurrection. We see it at Paul's first trial. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. He doesn't back down from the issue at hand. The question which has actually been stated as we see this court being convened to try to find some reason under Roman law for the Apostle Paul to be condemned so that he can send him to Caesar. Caesar will think, why in the world did he send me this prisoner? There is nothing under Roman law, now later there would be, when the resurrection and the truth of the gospel began to spread across the Roman Empire. But at that time, there was nothing that forbade Paul from preaching the resurrection. Later, because it began to shake the very foundations of Rome, the Christians came under persecution. The Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And when that began to topple the idols in the temples of Venus and Mercury and Jupiter and all the other pagan gods of Rome, then the Roman government began to get upset about it and the huge wave of persecutions under Nero and Diocletian and others came sweep sweeping across the empire. You see, 
it changes not only people, it changes governments too. And those in control don't like that thought. I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promise our twelve tribes, which indicates that the twelve tribes were still available at that point, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Verse 8, now get it. Verse 8. Agrippa knows about this. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Isn't that interesting? Now here's a switch in trial procedure. The accused questions the judge. The accused says to the judge, you already know that this is indeed what we as a nation have believed for centuries. You already understand the raw theology. You understand the theory. Now I'm telling you, it has happened. That makes a difference. Why should it be thought a thing incredible unto you that God should raise the dead? We have a basic premise here, that there is a God, that he in fact exists, that he is sovereign, that he is omnipotent, that he is the God who breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul back in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. It's something that the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 that every man will be held accountable for, that there is a creator God. He's made all kinds of images of other kinds of things that he worships, but he knows in his conscience that there is a God. He knows from creation that there is a God. He knows from the light of special revelation that there is a God. And it is a God to whom we all give an account. And so Paul turns the question and directs it to the judge. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now he moves back from the question. He doesn't wait for an answer, but he's put the question into the mind of the one who's listening to him, King Agrippa. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul says, at one time, I was where you were. In fact, I was even more radical than you, King Agrippa, because you know the theory, but you haven't done anything. I knew the theory because I was a Pharisee, but I actively opposed the Christians. I actively persecuted them. Listen to what he says here which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Now, Paul believed the theory of the resurrection. But Paul, because the Christians were preaching it had happened, said, I'm not going to put up with that. I'm going to put Christians in prison. In fact, even worse, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. By the way, that's a very important phrase in the New Testament because it tells us something about Paul that we don't have recorded elsewhere. When it says, I gave my voice against them, it's a special word that talks about casting a ballot in the Sanhedrin. Paul was not merely a Pharisee. Paul was actually a member of the ruling class. Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. To be able to do this, he had to be a member of the Sanhedrin. There was a second requirement for members of the Sanhedrin, besides all this knowledge of the law, which Paul clearly had. All members of the Sanhedrin had to be married. It's one of the reasons why, and we don't have time for that study tonight, that I think that the Apostle Paul was a widower. 
because he later talks about how he has the right to take a wife. But he could not have been a member of the Sanhedrin if he had not been married at the time that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Paul was not just some single dude running around doing his own thing. He had been married because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He uses the technical term for casting a ballot in the Sanhedrin when he says, I gave my voice against them. Gave his voice to whom? In the Sanhedrin, when the Christians were being put on trial, when they were being accused of blasphemy and then being put to death. Paul voted for their death. I had authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. Now you stop and think about it. You see, Paul had rejected what? He'd rejected the resurrection. And if the resurrection is not true, then what the Christians were doing was blaspheming. If the resurrection is true, Jesus is the Messiah. If the resurrection is not true, what Christians preach and teach is blasphemy against the living God. It's a very clear issue in the New Testament. It's kind of fuzzy for us in modern American so-called Christianity, New Evangelicalism in particular, but the resurrection is central because that cuts out all those who in fact are blaspheming because they deny that Jesus is God. One side is right, one side is wrong. If one side is right, the other side is in fact blasphemy. But if that side is right, then the other side is wrong and that side is committing blasphemy. They understood the issue, the dividing line is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why there is such vitriolic hatred against the Apostle Paul in this passage. And as he stands, he makes the issue very clear. And Agrippa understands it because Agrippa is an expert in the customs and in the law of the Jews. And he's married to a Jewess who was raised in the synagogue. A woman who knew what the scriptures said. How many of us know what the scriptures say, and yet it has not transformed our lives? King Agrippa knew it. Many Jewish boys throughout the centuries have learned it by heart. But unless God takes away the veil from their eyes, as Paul talks about, they not only will not, but they cannot believe. The veil of Moses is over their hearts until the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine into them. Only God gives light and life. Agrippa is blind, and Paul's going to give an illustration of what it means to be blind and suddenly be released into the light. I punished them oft in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now Paul says, now God broke through my blindness with light. Oh, Agrippa, you're blind. Oh, Agrippa, you have no light. You know the scriptures, but you do not know the one of whom the scriptures speak. Listen to this. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, they said, I, I caught all the ones I could find in Jerusalem. I checked out every synagogue. I persecuted them. I threw them in prison. I even voted against them in the Sanhedrin to put them to death. For as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Now Agrippa was expert in all that the Jewish scriptures taught. Agrippa would have understood what Paul was saying when he spoke of this blinding light and a voice coming out of the light. He would have understood that Paul was referring to the Shekinah glory of God, which appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where God says unto Moses, Take off your shoes, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. And he says, what, what's, what's your name that I'll say to the children of Israel when I go back to them, back there in Egypt? And God says to him, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am 
I am that I am hath sent me unto you. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Agrippa would have understood that. Agrippa would have understood the Shekinah glory. Agrippa would have understood the one who said, I am, is Jehovah himself speaking from that light. And here Paul says, the light appeared to me, and a voice came to me out of that, just like it did to Moses. And it told me who he was. Listen to this. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Shaul, Shaul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's a very sharp stick that when an ox is not plowing as it should and is balking, the one at the plow takes the stick and rams it into the rump of the ox, making it lurch forward and continue to pull the plow. And if the ox begins to back kick, it pokes it in the leg. The plow plowman pokes the ox in the leg. The voice comes to him and says, why are you persecuting me? Don't you understand how painful and how stupid it is to kick against the ox goad that is poking you? And now we have the voice and who it is that comes out of the Shekinah. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Agrippa would have understood the implications. Agrippa would have understood and remembered Exodus chapter 3. Agrippa would have understood and remembered the Passover. Agrippa would have understood and remembered the Exodus from Egypt. The central event that formed Israel as a nation, Agrippa was certainly not ignorant of that. He was an expert. He knew that that was the point at which God formed Israel, where God gave his promises to Israel, where God made a covenant with Israel. And now we find out who that God was. I am Jesus! whom thou persecutest. This only makes sense in the context of the resurrection of Christ. Agrippa had an intellectual head knowledge. He knew the great promises that a deliverer would come. Moses had promised it, or God through Moses had promised it. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that a prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise up, him shall ye hear. Agrippa knew that. Paul is dragging Agrippa back into the Old Testament law which Agrippa had been steeped in. He's reminding him of the promises of God that God had made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to Moses and to all the prophets of the Old Testament. The promises of David in the Psalms. There would be a risen Christ and he would prove it. Because here was Paul, a man who hated the Christians, who called them blasphemers. A man who persecuted them. A man who tracked them down. A man who was like a bloodhound who threw them into prison. A man who voted against them in the Sanhedrin to put them to death because he thought they were blasphemers, even though he theoretically believed in the resurrection. And God reached down from heaven and took him by the throat and shook him hard and said, Saul, why are you doing this? I am Jesus speaking to you from the Shekinah glory, whom thou persecutest.
Paul is not preaching to somebody who doesn't understand. It'd be like I stood up here in the pulpit and began to preach to you and only talk to you in Greek, or only speak Hebrew to you. You wouldn't understand a thing, unless every now and then I maybe interject a few English words. Agrippa knew what Paul was talking about. And that is what makes Agrippa so accountable. Folks, some of you have been in this church more than 50 years. You have heard the word of God preached from this pulpit at least twice, some of you three times on Sundays if you come to Sunday school. And again on Wednesday evening, four times a week, and then all the missions conferences that we have that run on extra days and other special events that run on different days of the week. And you have Christian radio and you have Christian books and you have Christian magazine articles and you have Christian newspapers and you have Christian TV broadcasts and you have Christian stuff over the internet and you are flooded with it. And for some, it is only head knowledge. Agrippa had head knowledge, but Agrippa was lost and headed for hell. We discover that a little later. It is not enough to know. You must believe. And if you believe, it will change your life. It's not enough to go through the motions. It's not enough to show up on occasion. How much fewer do we have tonight than we had this morning? Ah, how we tip our hats to God once a week, uh, if it happens to be convenient to be there once a week. Isn't it interesting? This is a trial that is going on as Paul speaks. I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear, unto thee. Now, if you and I were looking for somebody to be a witness for us, we would not choose our greatest enemy. We would not go out there and try to track down the guy who had been persecuting us and killing other Christians around us. You and I would look for somebody more sympathetic. But you see, God didn't. Because God changes hearts. You know, a child who was raised in a Christian home and, and then is very carefully taught and memorizes scripture and, and is called at a very early age and trusts Christ as a child and then goes through Bible college and seminary and maybe even gets an advanced graduate degree, you expect that person to be at least somewhat of a witness for Jesus. But for somebody who hated Jesus and all his adult life up to that point, has done everything he can against Jesus and has done everything he can to trip up Christians. Now, you know when he gets converted? He has a powerful testimony, doesn't he? It's not that he just sort of fell into it. He had opposed it. He had hated it. He understood it. He rejected it. He did everything he could to stop it. So if that kind of a person gets turned around, suddenly you have an impeccable testimony. Nobody can say he was bribed into it because he hated it with his very life. And God said, I have a purpose in this. I have a purpose in appearing to you. Jesus speaking to him. I have a purpose to make you a minister and a witness. What do you think Paul is doing in court? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm going to make you a witness. Paul's in court, and Paul is being a witness.
I'm going to make you a minister. I'm going to make you a witness. Both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. God promises him that he's going to give him more appearances, more revelation. And Paul mentions that as we get over into the epistles. And when I do this, says Jesus to Paul, and this is why Paul can be so bold as he stands before Agrippa. He says, because I'm going to deliver you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Paul's in a Roman court of law. Paul doesn't have to worry about the outcome of the trial because God has said, I'm going to deliver you, not merely from the people, ha'am in Hebrew, the people, that means the Jewish people, but from the Gentiles. And here's Paul standing before Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Three things that God does at the point of salvation. Paul didn't know who were the elect and who were not the elect. Paul didn't know who would respond and who would not respond. Paul didn't know who would believe and who would disbelieve. But he knew he was in a Gentile court. And he knew the message that God had given him to proclaim. And here's what he knew God would do. Number one, open their eyes. How does he open their eyes? With the truth. With the scripture. Agrippa knows the scripture. Paul is putting it to pieces of the puzzle together for him, helping him to understand that Jesus fulfilled everything the Old Testament said, that Jesus is the one who spoke to Moses out of the Shekinah glory in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. That Jesus is the one who spoke to Paul from the Shekinah glory on the road to Damascus. Number two and to turn them from darkness to light. Your eyes are closed, you don't see much light. Your eyes are open, you have the receptors of light are now able to receive the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Paul had seen Jesus and Paul came from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God, do you realize that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Paul understood the darkness to light concept because it had happened to him. He was in darkness and he suddenly got light on the road to Damascus. But he'd been under the control of Satan even though he'd been religious. There are many people who are religious who are under the control of the devil. Why do those three things happen? It tells you in the next phrase. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus is speaking there. Paul is quoting him. Christ came into the world to do what? Christ came into the world to save sinners. When God opens our eyes to the gospel of Christ, when God gives light to those blind eyes, when God delivers us from the power of Satan, it is that we might receive forgiveness of sin. But not merely forgiveness, that's the mere bottom line, but that we might also receive an inheritance among the saints, among those which are sanctified. Now, this morning we were talking about the doctrine of sanctification. There's a very important phrase here in verse 18. We'll be talking about that a little bit more, I think, when we get farther into that morning series. We all know that salvation is by grace through faith. Faith is always necessary in relation to salvation. It's not an automatic thing that just sort of rubber stamps you as you go through and you don't do anything. You have to believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the scripture is foundational. Faith is the response to it. Salvation is the result. But not merely salvation requires faith, but sanctification requires faith. Did you read that phrase? That's what it exactly says. An inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. 
Your sanctification depends upon your faith in Christ. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We all want to see. God says, I'm going to ask you to take a step where you can't see. I'm going to help you to grow by trusting me. We can't see God, but God says, if I call you to do something, you can step out in faith. If you can see it, it's not faith. If you can already calculate with reason what will happen, it's not faith. Faith is when we believe the word of God and say, God, I don't understand it, but I will step out because you've told me in your word, this is what I must do. Not merely what I must think about, what I must do. And you begin to grow. We are sanctified by faith in Christ. You know, we've talked about the three different levels of, of sanctification. We've talked about our positional sanctification. We've talked about progressive sanctification, just covered in a brief outline this morning. We've talked about ultimate sanctification, where we are completely free from all that is sinful and all that is corrupting when we ultimately get to heaven. But the progressive sanctification is what Paul is talking about in this passage. We are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus speaking here. Paul quoting him. You will not grow spiritually. You will see no progressive sanctification in your life unless you walk by faith. Don't walk by what you think is human security. Don't walk by what you think is politically correct. Walk by faith. You will not grow if you do not. Use God's standards, not man's standards. Make your choices according to Scripture, not according to the flesh. Not according to what makes you feel good, not according to what you think is going to be the best for you. You make your decisions based on faith in what the Bible says, and you will be blessed, and you will grow, and you will be sanctified in that progressive sanctification. By faith which is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, and this is what's so wonderful, this shows us the difference between Paul and us. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now visions and dreams and new special revelation have all ceased with the closing of the canon of the New Testament. You and I now have the scriptures. You and I now have the finished and completed word of God. Peter talks about how a voice came to them from the cloud. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Paul's just been talking about darkness and light, coming from darkness to light. Peter says, we have something that is even more sure than when the voice came to us out of the cloud and told us these things. We have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What's he talking about? The word of God. Did you know the word of God, the Bible, is a more sure word of prophecy than even having that divine special revelation, that happened once. Peter heard it. You and I can't hear it, but you and I do have the Word of God. And tomorrow we'll have the Word of God. And the next day we'll have the Word of God because the Word of God endures forever. It stands forever. It's a beacon forever. It's a light forever. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. 
Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. You understand the darkness and light concept is all the way through Scripture. That's Psalm 119, 105. The word of God. It is the foundation of your faith. You may not understand, you may not see, but you can walk by faith. And when you do, you will be sanctified by faith that is in Christ Jesus. I was not disobedient under the vision. And I was Paul saying, I didn't putter around. I didn't wait for a second opinion. I didn't scratch my head and think I better read what the rabbis say on this. I wonder what the Talmud says. I wonder what the Targum say. I wonder what the Mishnah says. He didn't go looking for it in the Bhagavad Gita of India. He didn't go looking for it in the writings of Confucius. He didn't go looking for it in some New Age philosophy. I was not disobedient. How many of us who have the Word of God have ever been disobedient? I know I have. Why? Because I hesitated, because I was scared, because I didn't walk by faith. Someday I'll have to give an account for that. Someday I'll have to pay the price for that. Someday I will lose heavenly rewards for that. But oh, how I desperately want every moment of my life to count for Christ, and yet I let so many of them slip away. How about you? How about you? What's most important to you in your life? Here's Paul standing before a judge who can issue a death sentence against him. And he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And here's Paul standing in front of Jews who accused him and in front of those who are pagan Romans. And those who know the Roman law and those who know the Jewish law. And he is not ashamed. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and to the Gentiles that I just realized my time is up. And I haven't even gotten halfway through. Let me read the rest of the passage, and then next week we'll talk about the other things that are important in this passage. That they should repent and turn to God and do works of, that works meet for repentance. What's Paul saying? He's saying that if you have true faith, you believe. And if you believe, you will walk by faith, because that's what sanctification is all about. And that if you really believe, it means you'll repent. You will turn from your darkness, you'll turn to God, and that it will result in certain things. Works, meet, that is fitted for repentance. Works that prove something has happened in your life. You see, believing the gospel is transformational. You cannot continue as you are. Because God will work in you, not only a work of grace for salvation, God will work in you to produce good works that glorify him. You all know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know verse 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And most of us stop there. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. If you're saved... You will do works that are meat for repentance, that is, works that are connected to that repentance because God has predestined those works in your life. And if they never show up, it's proof that you are not saved. Oh, people, that's what Paul's preaching here. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing. Oh, there we have it again, witnessing. Here he's witnessing in court, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. He takes them back to Moses. Remember, Exodus 3, burning bush, God speaking to Moses out of the burning bush, Paul on the road to Damascus. There we find the Shekinah glory, Jesus speaking to Paul out of the Shekinah glory, just like God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. So he takes them back to Moses and the prophets, they said should come. 
that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Oh, my. There is so much in that last set. But we will have to wait for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. Your word is transformational. Father, how we take it for granted, how we don't care. How often do we sort of slough it off? How often do we think that's not practical? How often do we shrink back in fear instead of walking boldly forward by faith? Knowing that what your word is, says is true and so we can trust it, we can count on it. And we can keep moving forward even when our eyes are blinded by the battle, the swords flashing, the arrows flying, the lights going on and off, the shields banging against each other, the enemy attacking with ferocity. We do not know exactly where our feet are going, but we are guaranteed that you will put us on the next step of the path if we'll move forward and do battle. Help us, Father, not to be afraid. Help us to walk by faith, sanctified by faith that is in me, said Jesus. So that when the end of the battle comes and our, when our victory is won, when we stand before the judge to receive our crowns at the Bema seat, he might say unto us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Father, you know that's what I want. Help us. Help me that I might hear those words. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 552. Please take your hymnal.